welcome. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, let's see if this works. Yes. Okay. So before we get going, I need to thank um, everyone that's made this possible this evening. And that means Antonia, Unz, uh, the whole team at Jamil, and especially uh, both of the Nadines. Um, um, and, uh, and of course, to uh, my guest this evening, uh, Himan Chong, for being the first guest, or is it guinea pig? Um, oh, always a pleasure to be one. Exactly. Uh, you already you you don't realize, but you signed a disclaimer I know, already. I know. Here. I know. Um, which uh, which we're calling uh, the essential, uh, and I'm yeah I'm mostly thankful to to Antonia because the two of us have been kind of hatching these uh, new formats together for some 14, 15 years now. So I'm really grateful that we're we're still able to. To, to kind of continue that tradition. So, um, let's see, okay. Uh, I wanted to briefly say something about how and why this idea came about. So there's something about the forward passage of time that opens up the past in ever renewing ways. What might have been experienced at first as random events and encounters reveal their secret code, their underlying patterns. Instead of chaos or contingency, you now see there was some kind of narrative purpose. Uh, so the definition of uh, epiphany. Uh, Chloe, how do we say it in Greek? Epiphania. Uh, epiphania. Um, manifestation, striking experience, is an experience of a sudden and striking realization. So increasingly, I realized I began to have epiphanies about the unknown epiphanies that I had earlier on in my life. A title from a painting that taught me how to arrange words. A scene from a film that, taught me how, that told me how to live or a line from a song that seemed to sum up the entire universe. Mm. Now, I've always uh, loved this verbal formulation, the essential. Uh, it was a very big thing uh, from the 80s mm. and the 90s. Uh, it became a way of uh, denoting uh, the kind of best of. And best of would mean most mm. commercially successful or simply best known. Uh, but somehow uh, those 10, 12, 20 tracks were uh, a kind of synthesized shorthand for who Billy Idol or Britney Spears or indeed Beethoven mm -hmm. was. Um, but I, I think there's another way to define the essential. And I think it's by asking someone to share the foundations of what they do, how they think, and the pivot points that got them where that is right now. Mm. And so I thought what we will do is we'll ask them to list the books, the films, the albums, the interviews, the essays, and anything else that proved formative in their own making, and which, importantly, they pa pass on to future generations to discover anew. Mm. Now, this is less concerned with formal historical canons. The essential is therefore more like an open syllabus, annotated with autobiographical asides. Mm -hmm. I, I really love some, some of these. Um, you can find various syllabi by you know, notable, in, these, in this case, writers, mm -hmm. um, or simply, you know, these are the books you have to read kind of thing. Um, and an, for me, they're extremely fascinating mm -hmm. insights mm -hmm. into the minds of these writers. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, the direct way into the mind of the writer would be, you know, obviously through the books that they read. Then it might be the interviews that they do, like the famous Paris Review mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But there's something kind of interesting and oblique mm -hmm. about the syllabi. The paratext. The paratext, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because it's almost... Yeah, it's a kind of or thinking, or, or references behind the, the facade of what they want you to kind of know about themselves. Mm -hmm. And more talks about a kind of technique of approach of how to think. 
mm -hmm. or how to educate yourself or yes. how to be educated or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, here's Auden's on the left. Uh, one of my favorite is uh, Donald Bartelme's. Um, this is just a short fragment, but it, I mean, it, it, it's, some, it's actually a list that oh. I followed for a very long time. Yes. Um, and then increasingly, uh, I mean, David Foster Wallace taught throughout his entire career as a writer. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, and now more and more you can access his various syllabi, yes. um, and which are interesting documents, not just for their content, but actually the way in which he wrote them. Yeah. Uh, he was famously a kind of grammar Nazi, um, and, uh, and you know, a real stickler for yeah, yeah. Uh, certain forms of precision of thinking and writing, and that comes across in the way in which yeah. he, he puts these syllabi together. Yeah. So, so since influence is passed through time like gravitational waves, the essential mm. becomes an intimate occasion to be inspired by inspiration itself. So to our guest this evening, He Man Chong was born in Malaysia, and uh, he received his master's in communication, art, and design from the Royal College of Art in uh, 2002 and lives and works in Singapore. Mm. As you know from passing uh, the books outside, together with René Stahl, he's co-founded the Library of Unread Books. Um, and we're uh, excited that we have a chapter now here in Dubai at the Jamil Art Center. Uh, I can tell you from first-hand experience that He-Man is a prolific walker uh, in the tradition of Walter Benjamin and uh, W.G. Siebold, um, I can tell you from first-hand experience that he walks and he narrates history to whoever accompanies him. And uh, he's even walked across Dubai, mm, I have. Uh, a city that I'm sure you all know was never designed for pedestrian psychogeography. You just have to run very fast. You just have to run very fast. Um, so I think this... Uh, kind of absurdist determination uh, <laughs> should tell you something about the kind of person He Man Chong is. Will you please join me in welcoming He Man Chong? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for coming. He Man, before we get going, we have, yeah. I believe, seven um, oh. uh, points in this journey. Yes, yes. Uh, how easy or difficult was it to put this list? together it's it's it was extremely easy easy for me because I have a, a very uh, defined way of um, documenting my references yeah so I literally have a folder on my computer that says read this <laughs> um, and it's it's very important for me as an artist to be influenced because I don't believe in the notion of the genius uh, and that I, I believe that every single word I, I would have written comes from every other word, no? It's just what, how Sorry. history is. Um, so I, I would often also produce a high level of transparency with my references. I would refer to my references in the work itself. Uh, it's also a, a very convenient way of inheriting the processes and of, tran of conceptualism about pointing at things. So I think it's all very, uh, what do you call that, useful and very honest to, to think about. So it was, it was extremely easy. Like the minute, from like the, the minute you sent me the email, it literally took like less than 24 hours for, for me to put it together. Really? Um, I also chose things that would be easy to discuss mm -hmm. because there are some refer inspirations and some references which would just be solipsistic, you know, like it's like, you know, something my mom told me or something, you know. So, um, which is very good advice, but you can't talk about it in public. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> the list represents things that I work with, let's say, I work with in my practice. And is there a particular order that you've arranged these references? Um, to be honest, I did not think about the order. I sort of put it together and, and thought we could create a kind of uh, meandering conversation about all seven things 
in relationship to the library of unread books, which you see outside, and also to my practice at Arch. And also the seven things that we're going to talk about, they don't necessarily have a hierarchy in my brain of which is more important or which is less important. And I also believe that something, uh, uh, the, the importance of something is not static. It changes over time. So perhaps that's how we're going to sort of talk about it as well. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So let's start with the, the first with one. the first yes. reference. I just want to ask the audience, because I'm curious, sure, because sure. I'm, uh, uh, who has not heard of Kim Lim here? Everyone. And who has? <laughs> okay, interesting. Uh, who has? I'm, who has? Who has, I think? Just Renee. Your oh, wife you. doesn't count. Uh, my wife doesn't count. <laughs> Uh, who else, actually? Put, put your hands up, please. Yes. And who, who else, else had heard of Kim Lim? Ah, okay. Nadine. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's, therefore we need a little bit of context. Yes, of course. Therefore, thank you. Yes. So Kim Lim is an artist from Singapore, and she uh, had studied in the UK in the 70s, and from then on she had stayed on in the UK and worked uh, in London. Uh, primarily as a sculptor, but she also has many drawings. I think what is interesting about Kim Lim's work at that is that uh, from very early on, it had entered uh, the collection of the Tate, but it was then put into storage. So it's kind of you know a, a, a very classic situation of uh, a body of work that was uh, that that gained uh, traction very early on and then had been sort of um, carried away by the by history let's say uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was forgotten but I think it was very um, there were all the socio-political uh, situations that had unco that covered it for a long time before uh, I think the last time I saw it installed in the Tate was just very recent like maybe in 2015 or 16 when they had a room and I had sort of walked in and there was just all the sort of classic sort of conceptualist painting like Stella and stuff and then there was this Kim Lim and I was just shocked to see it right next to a Stella, you know? Mm. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to see that these jumps, let's say. But to be honest, I'm not such a, like a, like a geek, like a fan, like a nerd about Kim Lim herself, but I, as well as, I, let me just explain myself. I'm, I'm, I don't like, um, I don't like to run after artists as much as I like to focus on certain artworks that they have made. So for example, I don't have a favorite filmmaker, I have a favorite film, you know? So that makes a lot of sense for me because I don't, also don't believe that uh, uh, an artist would be, you know, would be great enough to have made like every work that would uh, relate to me or something. So this work, uh, uh, for me has haunted me for a long, long, long time just because uh, 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 on the surface it's, it looks like a very, very simple sculpture. Super simple. It's made of wood. It's sand down. It's not painted so that it's, it reveals its grain and everything and sort of put together like a bed frame almost or like a series of ladders. But could I have the clicker? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at it, it says intervals one and two. So that's actually made out of two sculptures. And she has like an immense uh, set of instructions that these two sculptures should, could somehow become one work. This is amazing for me that uh, to, to also understand uh, sculpture in this way that it could be formulated in all sorts of different uh, uh, configurations through language. It's really through language that she has defined how the work would become, right? For example, like interval two, she has written instructions for it that it could be installed on the floor like this to become a kind of landscape, let's say. And uh, it could also sort of be flipped, sorry, sorry, flipped to, to, to um, interlink with each other, becoming like a chain almost. But what really, really, really appeals to me, do we have the last picture? No, no, sorry, sorry, I'm going too fast. 
what really appeals to me is the fact that you could sort of um, collate two sculptures to become one. This is this is totally you know advanced mm -hmm. for me um, in in the seventies. And if you also read her writing, it's very beautiful, very beautiful sort of um, uh, how should I say reflections on what sculpture is like. What is a drawing? What is sort of ex extremely formal concerns but at the same time you also I, I think she also understood that these things exist in time and space and that ch they change you know um, there's um, I just yeah. I have a few yeah kind of quotes which I think are, are interesting sure one of the famous formulations of hers apparently is less elaboration and more strength yes which is quite beautiful. It's beautiful, no? Because it's quite enigmatic. Yes, yes. Like you think you know what that means. Yes. At first, but it's not clear, and until yes. you, you know. And I so somehow it's performing what it's mm, about, mm, mm, mm. which is interesting. Yes, yes. Um, and then apparently um, she said, uh, towards the end of the seventies, Lim began transitioning to work in stone and marble. Mm. Um, and then she said, it made me very aware of the pull within myself between the ordered static experience and the dynamic rhythms of organic structured forms. Mm, 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 mm. How to incorporate and synthesize these two seemingly opposed elements within one work mm, mm, became mm, the starting mm. point. Yes, and yes. That's you know, it's exactly what you're it's talking about. It's incredible. It's an incredible way of thinking. Um, and it has truly, this way of thinking has truly permeated my way of thinking because, for example, I give a very, very simple example with the project that Rene and I have worked on in Jamil Art Center, where one of the questions that a lot of people ask us is, why don't you shelf the books? Why do you have the books on tables? Why don't you have them in stacks? Why don't you display them like in a way that's sort of fixed, as if it would, it would look like a, like a page from iBooks, right? It's like thumbnails. And I think this, this idea of stacking the books on the table it's a, it's a reference to sculpture. It's about stacking, about creating volume. And also it's very welcoming for people to pick up the stacks and to sort of rearrange them, like how Kim Lim would think about rearranging the work in order to produce a new work. So one of the reasons why we avoid shelves in the library is to constantly produce an, uh, 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 a very simple way of refreshing the library every day. So and whenever you walk into the library, it's a total disaster, right? Because like you, if you come up to us and say, if you ask the librarians, like, how do I find this book? And I was like, I don't know. You just have to look for it, no? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I, I can help you look for it, but it would take like an hour. So let's just do it now, right? So there's a lot of work with the library. And I think it's this work that separates our library from like, um, just a normal library, you know? It remains an artwork, but at the same time, it, it, it is also a functioning library. And I think that comes from this, mm. this idea of shifts. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so onto your next choice. Whoa, also yeah. a, a, a discovery for me. Same question. Um, who, has, who has heard of Rizal, Rizda, Rizal Pia, Piadasa? Rizda Piadasa. Who has heard of Rizda Piadasa? Even less than Kim Lim. <laughs> okay, so we need even more context here, please. Yes, Nima. yes. Yeah. So, uh, Pia Dasa is a very important artist from who has lived in Kuala Lumpur most of his life. So he's Malaysian. Uh, his, Indi his, 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 his Indian, his family is Indian. That sort of, I think it's like second generation Indian family in, in Malaysia. Uh, it's quite special because he works both as an artist but also as an art critic and also a teacher. So um, a, actually a lot of people see him as a very important art historian, more than a, an important uh, artist. But for me, he's both, or even also as, an, as a teacher. Uh, I'm gonna say something really ridiculous and sacrilegious, but it's just very personal, which is I truly believe that this is the only painting from Southeast Asia worth looking at. 
just because I'm obsessed about it, okay? So this is a painting that he made in 1972 called The Great Malaysian Landscape. And as you can see, it's literally a painting of a painting. So you have uh, the, the painting sort of containing all the paratexts of where this painting is being shown, like the, the of gravity, hook, frame, signature, title, edge, image, uh, even the zip, the zip is a, a specter of modernism from Barn and Newman, no? Surface. And he even shows you the three progressions of the great Malaysian landscape. So it's kind of like, I think it comes from a few places. It comes from his position or his insistence as a, a critic. He's criticizing mm -hmm. what the great Malaysian landscape is as a painting. But he's also coming to you, I feel strongly, as a teacher. He's trying to teach you about the entire sort of context of how painting is shown in Malaysia. And then at the same time, he's showing you how he's making the painting. There's all these different layers to it. I think it's incredibly pedagogical and interesting. And you had mentioned before that, you know, it's also a sort of a reference to language and kosus. And of course, this, all this comes in simply because, uh, I mean, uh, both Kim Lim and Pierre Dasa had existed in, a, in, a, in an era where it was really the, the sort of the birth of this play between image and language. Uh, and even, uh, sorry, it's worth yes. uh, saying that Reza also studied in London. Yes, yes. Uh, at the Hornsley College of Art, I believe, at Crouch mm, End. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and he obtained his degree in 67. Yes. So that's an interesting, I mean, it's the year that Derrida's first book exactly. kind, of, kind of comes out. Exactly. It's the beginning post, of post structuralism, yeah, yes, post-structuralism. Exactly. exactly. And I think, um, you know, also uh, Death of the Author, yes. I think Bart, Bart was first published yes, in, yes. in 67. It's a really key year yes, yes. when I think the, uh, a lot of the assumptions about writing and text were upended. Right. Yes, so yes. exactly, and, exactly. And, and for reasons of like uh, displacing power, you know, like assumed power relations yes. and all this kind of stuff. Yes, yes. And so you know, I didn't know this painting, but it reminds me of, of uh, Joseph Kossuth's famous three chairs, three chairs, which may, some of you may know. Or image. You know, I mean, he made many, many versions yeah, yeah. of these. But this whole yes, thing yes. about you know, that uh, talking about something. there's a thing, yes, there's what the yes. thing is called, exactly, and there's the representation exactly. of the thing. Yes, yes. Like all these sort of telescoping ways of, you know, relating or being estranged from, from a thing. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that, I mean, it feels like it obviously it belongs to a period in, in It does time, belong to it? a yeah. period. And I believe that that period hasn't ended yet. It, I feel like we are living at a very, very tail end of uh, a certain kind of post-structuralism, which has more or less become um, memes, no? The notion of uh, that we're sending all this like weird three-second animations, that, what do you think that is? That's essentially the tail end of post-structuralism mm -hmm. for me. Yes. Uh, so where did you, uh, when did you first come across this so, painting as and I how? Think, what was the context? I think as with everyone who has encountered uh, Pia Dasa, uh, it really is through uh, a book written by the art historian T.K. Sababati. And I think that that one book is really on the shelf of every artist in Southeast Asia because it's such, um, it's such a sort of cornerstone book. What's the book? It's just a, a what do you call that, a monograph of his work okay. and it sort of collects like 30, wor 30 years worth of his book. You could see like the production budgets are very low because it's like most of the plates are in black and white, you know, and there's maybe like 20 pages in color, um, but the essays are beautiful by, by Kanaga and- Written in English? Written in English. Almost, almost everything in Southeast Asia, I mean, at least Malaysia and Singapore. Yeah. It's written in English because uh, post-colonial British Empire. Um, uh, what am I going? I've lost a bit of tra track. No, where, when did you yes, come yes. across? Oh, it was in this book. Uh, yes, yes. I I first saw an image of this 
in black and white yeah. in this book. And I was like, this is incredible. And uh, I had for years uh, tried to see the actual painting, but it was in storage in the National Gallery of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Uh, I think only I only saw the actual work perhaps four years ago when they finally decided to hang it. Yeah. So, and did you? I mean, it's interesting you. You described it as educational. Yes, yes. It has this pedagogical function to it. I feel which, so. Uh, in a sense, works as much at a small stamp scale of a JPEG. When you saw it in actuality, did it reveal something else beyond what you'd seen as a representation? I think it w it's interesting to see it as a painting in real life because all these years I've been seeing, seeing it as an image. Yeah and in black and white. Mm. So I think that uh, it brings in this, this again, this, this discourse of reproduction, no? And how um, actually a lot of art that we encounter is through images. Most, most art yes. we know, uh, we see it on, on, as photographs or as on YouTube or whatever, you know? And actually, there's only a very small amount of art that we've, we've encountered in person. And I think that's very, very interesting, both for, for the audience and also for artists. And um, it, it does bring about, for me at least, thinking about something like painting, a kind of flattening of layers and things like that. So that's, that's a lot to unpack with that. So maybe we can come back to that. I mean, talking about yeah, painting. Almost impossible flatness. Yes, yes. Your third choice, mm. the great Onkawara, but a very specific mm. work. Could you tell us of it? Oh, okay, here, who has not heard of Onkawara? Yeah. <laughs> it's not snobbish because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just my wife in this room. <laughs> just a few people. Okay, so for those people, ah, let's okay, give okay. a little bit of context, Onkawara. So Onkawara is a Japanese artist who was born uh, in Hiroshima right uh, after the, the atomic blast. And he had spent most of his life in New York where he had decided to make his home. And he was essentially, he's essentially known as an artist who uh, uses, I guess the best way to describe him is that he uses everyday life as material. So he would stamp postcards that said, I am still alive, and send them to his friends. He had tomes and tomes of books of where he had drawings or where he walked in New York City. Beautiful, beautiful objects, you know? Um, and I think for me, the, the object that makes a lot of sense to talk about today is January 4th, 1966, New York's traffic strike. You might, you might wonder why there's a subtitle called New York's Traffic Strike. It's because he, every time he makes a painting, also oh, let me tell you about the basis of this painting. So it's, it's called a date painting, he calls them date paintings. And he would paint them on the day that uh, it's painted, yes. And if he doesn't finish the painting in that day, he would destroy it. And on some days, he would make uh, more than one because, you know, he's in good mood. He feels productive. And that's always a kind of a subtitle. So New York's traffic strike actually refers to the headline of a newspaper of that day where he would cut out and place into a box that, that he has made, handmade, a handmade box that would fit this painting into the box. So there's two layers to the work. So that's painting. Then there's the ready-made, the, the, so that also the appropriation of language. Uh, I like talking about this work a lot because I like, because one of the questions that a lot of people ask me is, what makes you an Asian artist? And I think this question is really, really interesting because a lot of people will look at my work and there's absolutely no Asian-ness in it. So the tropes, are, if, if any, they are, they are, they are shrouded in metaphor, or, or it, it, mo most of the time it's just a starting point, let's say. I do not like this question because um, 
whenever this question surfaces, what makes you an Asian artist? Or do you think of yourself as an Asian artist or a Singaporean artist? It often is actually a question that is disguised um, where the original question would be, are you Asian? Or are you Singaporean, right? And I like this work because somehow, psychologically, I could claim something arbitrary as Asian <laughs> without having <laughs> to take on something that is Asian. You see what I mean? Yeah. So it's kind of a clutch for me to think about January 4th, 1966, a Japanese man painted this painting in New York City. That's Asian enough for me. Does that make sense? Perfect sense. <laughs> Perfect yes. sense. Okay, good. But, I mean, I think when, when I think about uh, Uncle Wa and the date paintings mm. and his whole practice, mm -mm. I think about a kind of um, maniacal repetition. I think about this idea, it's as though he, you know, it's as though, I mean, it, it could have been a Paul Auster novel, oh. you know, 30 years later or something, 20 yes, years. Yes, yes. You know, like I'm going to invent a character yes, and yes. they're going to be kind of compelled yes. and condemned, yes, right, yes. to a certain kind of uh, ritualistic activity. Yeah? And yes, and that sets uh, and that somehow sets up their life. Yeah, yeah. Um, by setting up what seems to be an extremely simple but uh, rigid uh, kind of rule. Mm -mm -mm. It's almost an algorithm for life, yes, right? Yes. So, but within that seeming uh, stricture is an Im almost infinite yeah. uh, amount of diff difference uh, variety. Uh, and kind of openness, you know? Yes, yes, And it's that, uh, you know, and, and I guess, I mean, I, I'm sure at the beginning there would have been a certain kind of Orientalism here which would have said, you know, this has something to do with like Japanese-ness, you know? Mysticism. Mystic like, this is a sort of oh, monk-like... It's so zen. Yeah, it's so zen, right? Oh my like, God, it's so zen. Just doing this thing, doing this thing, doing this thing. Do the esoteric thing. Do the esoteric thing. <laughs> So that's not the Asian-ness that you, uh, yeah, no. you relate to. But so what, how, does, how does the Onkawara then impact, or how is it impacted in what, in what you do? And are, are some, is, is it located in those sort of, uh, those, you know, uh, associations, or is it, is it something else? I think to talk about that is to talk about migration. I think it's important to note that also Onkawara had moved from Hiroshima to Mexico, to the Paris, to New York, where he decided that he would stay. And I feel that identity has always been a kind of soft, pliable object rather than something that's fixed in stone. And I think he sort of embodies that. Um, I do see this piece for me as a, 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 as a kind of starting point, I guess, of something important, but we might not sort of understand its importance yet mm. because uh, it's, 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 believe it or not, I feel like this is still a very fresh work that's been sort of thrown out in, into this, the realm of the contemporary, even if it's been around since 66. Um, I feel like a lot of writing about the date paintings uh, has, hasn't really gotten to the heart of it. Like, what does it mean to sit in a room in New York and to paint dates, you know, other than this quasi-mystical bullshit that we, all, we have all been accustomed to talking about Kawara and his practice and his, you know, sort of this kind of rote and stuff. But I feel like there's still a lot to think about. And I want to be part of that process, you know. So apparently, he he created nearly three thousand of these date paintings yes. in more than one hundred and twelve cities. Yes, yes. So if it if he goes to a a city like Barcelona, you would see like like January or May being spelt in the Spanish way and stuff. He avoids using um, like Chinese or. 
Japanese. So he used Esperanto. He uses Esperanto in when they cities, don't use when they, yeah, Roman. The when Roman they use Latin based characters. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I don't know why though. Yeah, why not just Japanese letters? I know. Yeah, it's weird. Um, and maybe the final thing to say about Onkwara, he, d he died in 2014. Yes, um, before his retrospective at the Guggenheim. That, that's interesting too. Yeah. Yes. But his published obituaries state that he was alive for 29,771 days <laughs> rather than giving uh, yes. dates of birth and death. Yes, yes. And I love that. Yes. I think that's beautiful as well. He also resisted um, photographs um, of himself. There's only yeah, I don't know what he looks like. I have no idea. There's like one known photograph of him when he was like in his 20s or something, but nobody actually knows how he looks like. And I think it was, it's also kind of necessary for his kind of work to have that kind of non-visage, you know. Okay, uh, number four, mm. a letter by Felix Gonzalez Torres. To Andrea to Rosen. Andrea Rosen, his gallerist at the time. I'll just read it for you. Yeah. September 27, 1994, New York City. Dear Andrea, how does one begin the day? I guess I never take anything for granted, and I hope I never do. These days, I begin the days with a certain excitement, a certain desire to actually get up from bed, to do new things, to new beginnings. It is important for me to be the way, it is impossible for me to be the way I was before, impossible. The marks left for me are delible, <laughs> indelible, but I have certainly learned so many lessons, perhaps against my will, but here we are. And how do I feel? I feel I'm ready for new traveling, travelers, travels, travelogue, and the rest. And how do I feel? I feel something is missing this year, a void, a certain lack, not having the show at your space, my lab of ideas, my place of testing, always a new voice. And how does one create a new voice every so often? Am I too rushed, trying to say as much as possible before this journey is over? Yes. But that is the way it is. That is what we have to face. How does one learn not to fear the night any longer, that the darkness comes and one can actually go to sleep and sleep until the next day and wake up without this metallic and bitter taste in one's mouth, the taste of guilt, desire for death, the desire for a quick and final end. I guess one cannot learn these things. They just sink into our bodies in a very subtle way Yet it is definite, it is there, and we can sense it. How good. I am ready for new travels, to new routes, Felix. So you discovered this? Uh, in a when? book, in a book um, by book Julie Alto, in a kind of retrospective book. It was published in 2016. Someone gave me as a gift this book. And I, actually, I wasn't really so familiar with Felix Gonzalez Torres then, but I think this book sort of summarized it for me and I became a total devotee afterwards. But this letter is important for me because I've, for a long time, I've been looking at artist writings a lot. I think artist writings are very important uh, for my practice, uh, even if a lot of it is terrible and cannot be read. Um, but so much of it also contains a kind of source code of the practice. And I think especially for Felix Gonzalez Torres, his, I mean, his, the correspondence between him and his galleries is like unbelievable. The most beautiful love stories, you know. And I love that, that, that human side of him. I love that, that intimacy that he has with, his peop with his, the people around him. I had once borrowed a, a, a work from the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation, Perfect Lovers, The Two Clocks. Mm -hmm. And it came from the found, and, and it came for an exhibition that I had curated in Vita de Vit in Rotterdam. And the work came um, as a contract, as like 87 page contract. And I love that within the contract, it states when he was alive, Felix Gonzalez, Mr. Felix Gonzalez Torres loved to talk to people. Um, the, to the people who look after his work in the galleries. So if you could uh, take some time and talk to the, the, the gallery sitters and the guards in the museum 
and to talk to them about this work, and that uh, that they could then they that they to encourage them to talk about this work to the audience, that would be great. And this is like black and white in a contract, isn't that beautiful? And um, I think that there's something that we can all learn from that, even if it's a very cryptic work like Perfect Lovers, and that it could be be talked about by people who are not experts, not art historians, not critics, not artists, but like a night guard, a night guard in a museum would, would be able to talk about it because you had talked to him about it. And he would explain it in a way that perhaps it could be, you know, more more human than than anything else. So I like I like that a lot about Felix Gonzalez Torres. On top of of course his incredible and brilliant sort of oath of of his practice. But you uh, earlier you used the word intimacy. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, how is it intimate? Do you think? I think it's intimate because there is a there is a kind of desire for transmission using words, using conversation. And also like in, in my work, a lot of my work is about talking to people, right? And how uh, something is, is produced out of, out of these conversations and this kind of you know, entanglements, let's say, that, that life is complex rather than a sort of clean modernist slate. Um, and that's why I chose this writing as one of my references. Uh, he's uh, he he died relatively young. Yes, um, and so too did Robert. Uh, your Bolano. next choice, yes, Robert Bellano. Uh, Twenty six sixty six is a is a very very thick novel. Ha has anyone read it? Twenty six sixty six. It was originally originally written in Spanish. No, no, even more cryptic. He wrote it in a mix of Chilean. Spanish dialect and Mexican. So like my friends in Spain, when they read it, they're like, what? You know? So even the original text is very, uh, the, the language itself is very enigmatic. I'll tell you why, it's his last book. He had been diagnosed with cancer and he was like rushing to write it. And uh, uh, as it stands, it's like 960 pages or something, spread across five different books to make 2666. Um, it is a novel I've read, I don't know, like 25 times around. Um, when was the first time and how did it arrive at, at you? I first read the book when someone had written on Facebook, like, does anyone have a copy of 2666 in English because it's all sold out on Amazon? So I was like, what is this? I mean, it's a beautiful title. It's a very enigmatic title. And um, if you would read the novel, uh, it's not found in the novel. And there's just a very short sort of ex uh, uh, floating around. It might be made up or something that he had once said that there is a secret in the novel, but he would just never tell it to anyone and that this secret is at the heart of the novel. And I think it's, it's, it's a kind of sublimation also of the title, 2666. Um, okay, to cut the long story short, uh, the, the entire novel is about a writer who uh, has a very strange name. I'm not gonna give it away. He has a very strange name and you cannot quite tell like which country he's from, but he has written uh, uh, maybe six books in his whole life. And he and, and, and by chance, uh, a group of academics have chanced upon it, hence the first book in the, in the book, uh, which is called The Part About the Critics. And uh, what I'm trying to say is that the book is about writing, let's say. The book is about writing and uh, the life of a writer, also the, the, the kind of uh, effects of history on writing, writing as a journey, literally as a journey. Um, book four in 2666 is the most violent section of a book I've ever read in my life. 
which is uh, 328 accounts of uh, grisly murders of women in a fictional town in Mexico City called San Teresa. I think he just really wanted to show that we live in a misogynist world and just to have that. This was based on real... It's uh, based on like real... real city called yes, Ciudad yes. Uh, Juarez. Yes, yes. And some three to four hundred it's a border murders. Town. Yes, yes. Often the very young girls. Yes, extremely yes. gruesome. Yes, yes. Uh, and so he's sort of writing fictionally about around this, right? Yes, so. yes. Uh, uh, it's worth saying. I mean, he he died at fifty. Yes. Uh, he considered himself first and foremost a poet. A poet. Um, he led an extremely dissolute early life. Terrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was nothing that he didn't do for money. Yes. Uh, and lived uh, often, I mean, e technically homeless or close to homeless, but yeah, in a yeah. sense, again, uh, almost uh, a life uh, uh, as, a, as a fictional character. Yes, yes. Which seems then later in his life that he calls upon. Uh, and so many of those experiences, what, you know, Luke Sande would call like low life life and, you know, then make appearances, uh, seem allied with this kind of more, much more high, yeah. you know, uh, esoteric notions of poetry, what it means to be a writer. Yeah. But these two things always seem to go together, right? Like yeah. the, the sort of heights of intellectual possibility, but then this kind of grisly corporealness of, of life it, itself. Yes, yes. And it seems that, I mean, he, later he, he gets married, he has two children, oh, and he, he knows that he's going to die. Yes. And there's a, actually the, this book, is partly uh, an attempt, to, he says, to create, you know, or leave security for his children, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, and he I wants, always he wanted the book to be published as five, five books, books so that they'd every get year money. his children would get money from it. But his lawyer and his wife overturned it and published it as a single volume, which I, I kind of agree with, to be honest, because you know Netflix. You just want to watch all the episodes at once. <laughs> you don't have to wait yes. year after year. Year no. after year. It's worth saying also the epigraph at the beginning is from mm. uh, Baudelaire mm, mm, mm. and it's an oasis of horror in a desert of boredom. Yes, yes. Which is such a great line. It's such a great line. But that, amazing. that really sets things up. Yes, it does. How much of those 960 pages are boring? There's one part in it, which has 30 pages of a father talking to a daughter, to his daughter. And it's like, wah, 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 you know, like how a uh, disapproving father would relate to uh, uh, his teenage, teenage daughter. And literally, like this monologue lasts for 30 pages. And at the end, you would turn the page, and then the last line would be, Dad, I have absolutely no idea what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing. You're just like reading like, where the hell is this going? And then like the daughter just summarizes, but you're like, I have no idea what you said. <laughs> in, um, in the latest version, I believe, uh, there's an introduction by Ben Lerner. Yes. And uh, uh, it's entirely written in questions, which is interesting. Yes. But there's one part where he says, what does it say about you or the novel if you find yourself skipping over many of these passages? What does it say about you or the novel if you find yourself ribbit, riveted by the descriptions? Yes, yes. But um, I think the novel is so long because he literally died before they went through this editing process. So everything, everything just went in. Yeah. And also, yeah, that's, that's just my suspicion. I, I have no way of validating it. Okay, okay. and on to number six. We'll just watch this first. It's a trailer of a film called Shrekers. When I was 18, the thing I wanted more than anything was to make a movie. I had the idea that you found freedom by building worlds inside your head. That you had to go backwards in order to go forwards. But I never imagined it would end this way. Whenever you're ready. Now. Oh, oh, 
In the summer of 1992, my friends and I shot a road movie on the streets of Singapore called Shirkers. I was the screenwriter and played the heroine, a 16-year-old killer named S. Did you feel it was childish? Yeah, but that was the beauty of it, right? Our passion and our earnestness came through. Sophie was the producer. Jasmine was the editor. George was the director. Were you rolling? Yeah. I chose George as my new best friend. A man of unplaceable age and origin. After shooting Rat, he took everything. George was gone. And so was Shirkers. George had this perverse need to create mythology. Give us the materials so we can finish the film. How could it have disappeared? What stakes did he have in this mind game? I like knowing that we're connected and we're partners in crime. Shirkus became a secret history that would haunt us and bond us forever. What? Just a disclaimer, we're not sponsored by Netflix. Um, so this came out late last year. Yeah. You're the one who pointed me to it. Really? You wrote me like, Shrekers. Oh, did I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Um, so it came out last year, but as the trailer says... Uh, Escape, I think. It's a story that goes back to 1992. Yes. Uh, and this character, Georges Cardona, seems to be the linchpin, as well as these three teenagers. Mm, 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 mm. So, I mean, obviously we get a sense of what's going on here. Um, mm, mm, mm. Why is this your sixth choice? Because it's interesting because it's very recent, yes. as opposed to a lot of these other things that we well, can say are it's recent, canonical. but... But also, so this whole situation could only happen because of one thing in Singapore, which is Singapore's first artist-run space called the substation. And they had all sorts of classes. You had yoga classes, you had filmmaking classes, you had photography classes, you had everything. So everything in 1992 revolved around this one artist-run space. Mm -hmm that was set up by Kuo Pao Kun, who is a very uh, important theatre director. So, what I'm trying to say is that Shrekas, if you're in your 30, late 30s and in your 40s, Shrekas inevitably would have be, been a part of your history too, mm. because everything that had transpired to make this film would be like a door away from you know, a room away from what you were, whatever else you were doing in this artist-run space. You would be like setting up a show and this kids next door would be like trying to make a film. So I think in a very oblique way, I feel very close to this. Uh, even, I've, even if I've never met Sandy who made the film, I've never met Josh, I've never taken a filmmaking class because I don't make films. Um, you really felt the spirit of this. Like, it, it, also, it was also a myth in Singapore mm. that everyone sort of talked about. And in a way, it haunted all artists that someone could run away with all the reels of a film that someone, that they had shot and had denied 18-year-old kids, three 18-year-old girls of finishing a film. This is crazy, no? So it's, it's a kind of specter, I guess kind of ghost that has always been with us. Yeah. But it's interesting, I mean, it's interesting after the Balano. Yeah. Because that's also a kind of 
mystery. Yes, yes. And, uh, and in real life, I think these mis the, these this mass murder of of, of girls and women was yes, some, yes. was remained a mystery. You know. Yeah. So, but what's um, instead of uh, a literal death here, it's a kind of mystery of yeah. uh, the theft, not necessarily of a film, but the materials for a film. The and reels, then it doesn't the even, mm -hmm. you know, normally this would resolve itself that, you know, we, I mean, men stealing the labor of women, well known, yeah, but yeah. usually they do that and then take credit for it. Yeah, yeah. And then become famous and win a Nobel yes, Prize. Yes. I mean, this guy literally just vanished. He just literally like this George vanished. Cardona, who's a very shady, enigmatic character who claimed that the character in Sex, Lies and Videotape, played by James Spader, who's a kind of like pathological yes, pervert yes. in that great film, yeah. was somehow based on him, right? So, yeah, yeah. which is a really weird thing to tell a bunch of 18 year old girls from Singapore. Yes, yes. Um, so there's something, I mean, what's interesting uh, for, to me about the story is the way in which these various threads don't necessarily, they don't link up. You know, like the, yes. the, there's some, there's a kind of mist, the mystery continues. But I think this documentary is only possible because the, like Sandy had got a call from Josh ex-wife yeah. 20 years later saying, hey, I've got your reels, do you want them? Like, what? Yeah. You know? So I think it's as much a mystery, but it's also a kind of, uh, how should I put it? A kind of return. It's a, it's a story about returning, no? That these reels will return to these girls. But then the soundtrack was missing. Yeah. Like how, what, what will you do with that? So there's this, all these layers to the work. And, you know, like, I can't even begin to understand what Sandy would be thinking about. Like, do I make a film now? Do I talk about the film? So it's a bit like Pia Dasa, no? It's like I'm doing this, I have this painting, but I'm going to talk to you about this painting. I'm going to point to you the diff different parts. And for me, that's very interesting to, to think about. Um, you know, art history, exhibition history, the history of the world. So there are these layers upon layers of material that I think sort of make up the world. Well, that reminds me that the, uh, I mean, the, the etymology of the word essay yeah. is essay, French, to try, uh, to try, to yes, try. Yes. I mean, that's what they were at the beginning, yes, especially by yes. Montaigne, right? Yes, like that. Yes. They're, they're sort of attempts at. Yes, yes. And uh, I think it seems to me, you know, like yeah. the attempt to return to something yes, yes. will be documented. Yes, but what, absolutely. What you're documenting is, is an attempt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, and on to your last. Oh, the last, the last choice. Choice is from the French director, Claire Denis. And it's a bit mean to show an ending of a film but I can assure you, even if you have seen the ending, you don't, you still wouldn't know what the film is no. about. Okay, let's just let's watch this. But I, I maybe let me talk before we screen it. Yeah. So the uh, this ending has absolutely haunted me since 1999. I've seen it, big screen, film festival in Singapore as a teenage boy, and um, I just. And when I was watching Bo Travai, I just could not see how she would end this film because this film is endless. It's like trying to talk about the end of capitalism or something, you know? It's, it's insane. You, it, wouldn't make, it wouldn't make sense, you know? And, and it would it'd be like what Savo Cizek would say, like it's easier to imagine the end, end of, of the, the world, world than to end, imagine the end of capitalism. And in a way, like this film for me, um, I just, you know, it was such an experience for me that I could not, under, could not see how she could end it in a way that would satisfy me as a teenage boy, you know? Um, Should we just give a little bit of context? It's a film based on a novel by Melville. Melville, by Melville Billy Budd. Billy Budd. Yes. Uh, it's set in Djibouti. Yes, it's set in Djibouti. Um, and uh, really it's a cast of men. It's a cast of legionnaires. Legionnaires. French legion and the kind of interpersonal dynamics yes, yes. of power, lust, envy, yes, yes. latent, explicit homosexual, homosocial yes. dynamics, colonialism, yeah, 
And Claire French, Denis, French though Empire. French, grew up in several yes, yes. West African mm, mm, mm. countries mm, mm, mm. and uh, due to her father uh, and has spent pretty much uh, all, almost all of her film career yeah, yeah. Um, uh, wit bearing witness, yes, yes. I think, to the, to the history of French yes, colonialism yes. in West Africa. Yes, yes. Um, uh, but Beau Travail, if you've not seen it, it's, it's I mean, wonderful, it's, it's beautiful. It, but it's known for um, these extremely like balletic uh, performances of these men um, in very hot, in very hot climate, um, uh, pra you know, practicing being trained. But training for nothing. But training for nothing. Tra right. Training for nothing. Oh, one of the reasons why I chose this as a reference or an influence is because it gives, it gives me courage to not have to end my work, not to have to end a piece in this sort of finished way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that, it gives me courage to use uh, an open-ended way of, of, of you know, finishing a work, let's say. Let's, let's, let's watch, watch it. I it's mean, a, bit, you it's to, a bit shocking. You have to bear in mind, <laughs> most of it has taken place under yes. this scorching yes. sun. Yes, yes. And these bodies in outdoors, you know, in yes. kind of different forms of aggression. Yes. And now we see the, the protagonist, he, had re he has now returned to Marseille, to the fatherland. It's a bit long, it's like five minutes. It's less. Yeah, okay. because we don't have to do all the crap. Okay. I'm also very drawn to this film because I, I was in the military for two and a half years. I think it's my favorite Claire Denis film. Mm -hmm. Flashback. Mm, flashback. The weapon, identity.
Fica seca. I thought it's, it's hilarious that she was sort of suggesting that the end of the French Empire is essentially a song from Corona, no? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it, I also love the fact that you've ended on an ending. Yes, yes. So that means you did give some, give some thought to oh, the sequence. Oh, just for the last one. Just for the last one. Yes. We're not dressed in Zara. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, He-Man, before I uh, ask people if they have any mm. questions, mm. My, one, uh, my question is, uh, if you could have an eighth oh. entry, what nearly made the cut and would make the That's cut? That's a really good question. Oh, no. Think about it. <laughs> I'll come back to you. Does anyone else, does anyone else have anything they, they'd like to ask? Any questions? Um, yeah. Oh, you? I feel like, Sorry. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The impact of Shaka. Yes, you. yes. I feel like it doesn't read, okay, I love, I love what Sandy has now done with Shaka's, the documentary. It's, it's a great film. You should all watch it tonight <laughs> on Netflix. Um, but I feel, I feel like it has been like a rumor that has been with me since I was a child. Like, hey, did you hear like someone stole their film? You know, like, what? What do you mean like someone stole their film? It's like, yeah, this creepy guy stole this kid's film, you know? So it's kind of like, a, like an urban legend in Singapore and it's always sort of stayed with us. And, or at least with me, that it's become a kind of fiction and that, you know, I also strongly believe that reality is really only made out of fictions, of stories that we tell each other. And I feel like Shrekas is one of those stories that has always been at the back of my head, like that this film that was shot in Singapore in 94 was then stolen and missing. And that, you know, like um, nobody has seen it until Netflix. You know, it's strange, no? Like one day you just watch, you could like literally watch it. And I, it was just such a shock to me when I watched it, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. Anyone, anyone else? Eight. Uh, over yeah. here, please. Eight. Oh my God. Uh, so I guess my question would be, uh, you talk about revisiting yeah, a lot yeah. of the things, yes. seeing, rereading the book, seeing the works again. Yeah. How much of a different impact does the ritualistic revisiting of yeah. the works give you as you've gone through your life? Oh. Obviously, some of them are very recent. Yes, yes. But the ones you encountered earlier on in your life, as yes. you grow older, yes. what, what is the difference in impact it has on you? Yes, my yes. Question. it's a great question, and this question will lead me to your to number answer eight. to your question. So when I was a kid, all I read wasn't comic books. Like a lot, lots of kids like read comic books and stuff. I only like dedicated myself to reading every single choose your own adventure book. Do you know what these books are? Mm -hmm. They are like books that you would read something, and there's, then there's instruction to say like if you want to turn left turn to page 5. If you want to turn right on this corner, you turn to page 12. And then you would turn to page 5 like, oh, you fell off a cliff, you died. <laughs> you know? So there are like 10,000, I mean, not 10, like 300 endings in this book. And I think what I'm trying to say is I still read these books. So it's, it's just been with me all my life to be able to think about a story that does not have a fixed ending. You see what I mean? Like that, that something is always a part of something else and that it's always in the process of becoming something else. Yeah. So is that your eighth? Yeah. That's the one that, Conven the late comment. Conveniently. Conveniently. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the art. I, I, used, I used to read those as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. I mean, they were kind of, they were like low tech video games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, exactly. uh, in book form. Exactly. Exactly. In rhizomatic. Uh, anyone else? Question at the back there, please. This will have to be the last question, then we'll. Wrap Sorry. It up. Thank you. Hamad. Hi, Heyman. Um, 
I was just going to sort of push back a little bit on that, on the push your, uh, you know, your own adventure. Yeah. Because um, isn't all, I mean, a good book. Yeah. Uh, doesn't all, do, don't all good books allow you to do that? Yes, and if they I agree. Don't, I agree. That's why I read really all literature. books. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have an eight, you have an 800 or 8,000. I agree with you. I agree with you. But I just wanted to push <laughs> this thing back to. But it, it's, it's true that all, in fact, all fiction um, produces different effects on the readers, no? And that uh, they're never, it's, that's why reading a book is very different from watching a film, I feel that it, it has less of a, um, a possibility to fix the narrative as an image and that you're always constantly producing that image in your brain. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have one last question for Rene. We have the microphone at the front here. Oh, Rene, no. <laughs> what, uh, if you were to put uh, number nine in here, <laughs> what do you think is possibly missing from mm -hmm. He-Man's list that you know has had a big impact on him? Mm, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, um, you said he was prolific walker. I think the walking oh, yes, is also yes. something Road movies. Yeah. Road movies. Road movies, but yeah, I don't know. Anything that yes, yes. Um, made him the walker he is today mm, and the, the walk. wa walking influences everything else. Oh, yes, yes, it's true. Yes, so um, I would recommend you all to go for a walk with Hima <laughs> if you ever get the okay. chance. Uh, yes. It's a very, very special thing to do. 12, um, 12 99 per hour. <laughs> <laughs> Family friends discount. Family friends for anyone discount. in this room. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll text you my Swiss account. Yeah. Um, so this has just been published. Uh, yes, library of unread books, which uh, accompanies the library out there. Yes. Uh, available in the bookshop. Is it the front desk here? At the shop. Gift shop. Uh, with the. Yes. Yes. Uh, 6.99. <laughs> and then if you're very cruel, you would deposit it immediately in the library <laughs> out there. So we don't want to see a whole load of these. Not funny. Well, kind of funny. Um, all right, Not we're done. Funny. Will you please join me in thanking Heeman Chong? Thank you all. Thank you for coming. <laughs>